Welcome back, folks, to Historic Flight. Again, my name is Mike Lavelle, for those of you I didn't meet the first time. And we're going to begin our second series on the history of air racing. This will be a three series session. I'll start off today with the National Air Race Overviews. This will be followed by my colleagues, uh, Dave Lednicer, who will do the aircraft racing aircraft, their design, modification, and performance and followed by Barry Ladder, who will do design modification of the power plants that went into these aircraft. So with that in mind, we'll go ahead and get started on the uh, briefing for the overview of the National Air Races from 1920 to 1940. The uh, agenda will follow, looks exactly like this. What I'd like to do is start off with the evolution and the expansion of air racing. How did that all start? When did it start? And what did it lead to? And then we'll get into the main US air race venues, starting with the Pulitzer races in 1920 to 1925. There are some transition years that was between 25 and 1929, where the national air races really became solidified and carried on through the 30s into the uh, 40s. And we'll kind of center it around the main events. Now, this wasn't all the air racing that was taking place during that time, but we'll look at the main uh, trophy races, what it meant and what it uh, encouraged in the aviation industry itself. To follow that agenda that you see in front of you, what I'd like to do is put it on a timeline. And if we look at this timeline, from 1920 to 1940, the so-called golden years. It was a time period where there was a great transition in aircraft design and performance uh, to include air racing, but also outside of air racing. Wooden fabric aircraft were transitioning to all metal modern airplanes. And by 1940, most of the new aircraft designs were metal aircraft and air racing was right in the middle of all of that. So we'll kind of do this in three sections. I'll start off with the very foundations, going back to 1909 that led up to air racing, the uh, uh, event of air racing, the venue of air racing, and why it became popular. Then we'll move into post-World War I from 1920 to about 1930, where you saw a annual uh, venue here in the United States of various races. Moving from the uh, 20s into the 1930s, uh, air racing became very popular with the venues that were offered. And this is where aircraft, industry-wide, as well as in air racing itself, became the uh, true modern uh, propeller-driven uh, aircraft. And as we look at that, it's uh, taking place around three basic requirements the airplanes were having. Uh, aircraft generally fall into uh, requirements of going faster, further, and higher. So that's what we'll, uh, be, we'll, we'll be dealing with. And to do that, to kind of give us an understanding how air races were put together and managed, we'll kind of look at this little model for the uh, uh, air racing business itself. To start with, it's, it's good to have a venue. Where are you going to have it? What are the facilities that are offered? And you need sponsors. Uh, and doing that, that's where air, uh, air race management comes in. And what they try to do is to bring all the parts together uh, for an air race to take place. And this is going back to the very first ones, as we'll see. Now, from that, what air race management is trying to do, as I said before, bring all the parts together. So if we look at a larger triangle outside the initial one, you see we have uh, designers and manufacturers they're actually building the aircraft, uh, pilots and those that maintain the aircraft at, uh, during the race. The pilots and the manufacturers can be from the same organization or they can be separate. In other words, a pilot can, of course, purchase an aircraft for the purpose of air racing and have his own crew. Uh, nonetheless, whether it's the designers and the manufacturers and the pilots and the mechanics, they all have one thing in common. They want to go for the uh, grand prize. That is usually represented by some type of trophy. Going for the grand prize, there's some kind of a, a prize money offered, but name recognition is just as important for them. That will give them perhaps uh, avenues to the future and continued growth. 
With that in mind then, the trophies were usually a symbol or a representation of being the best at the main event for whatever that air race happened to be. And some of the classic ones going back in history, we have the Gordon Bennett Aviation Trophy from 1909 to 1920. Of course, it was interrupted during the war years. The Schneider uh, Seaplane Trophy, uh, that went from 1913 to 1931. And if we look at uh, the next one that really brought air racing to the United States on a annual basis, at least initially, the Pulitzer Prize Trophy from 1920 to 1925. And then when we had the national air races from 29 uh, up until 1962, we had two other main ones, the Thompson Trophy for closed course racing, as well as the Bendix uh, Trophy for the transcontinental uh, uh, cross countries that were associated with the national air races at the time. And we'll cover uh, most of that. So having that, you have the media attention, which of course uh, generates interest for the general public. And you try to bring it all together in, in that vein. So with that as background and the outline, uh, where do we start? We have to pick some date. You can pick any date in history, I suppose, and lead up to it. But for our purposes, what I like to do is to start with a well-known aviation event that took place on July 25th, 1909, when Louis Blerio makes a, a courageous flight of 26 miles across the English Channel in 37 minutes. It, it was kind of a daunting task. You think 26 miles, that can't be that bad. Well, uh, bear in mind, uh, when he did take off, he could see probably the coast of England, but weather changes quickly in the channel, which it did. He had no compass, and he actually uh, became somewhat disoriented and lost. He, threw, he flew through a, a bit of a, a rainstorm, which was fortunate because it cooled his engine down, which allowed him uh, to make landfall eventually. And in doing so, he had to fly up and down the English coast, uh, trying to figure out where he could land. He saw a, rather, a relatively flat area around Dover Castle, headed for it. And you can see the airplane approaching over a rather flat place, but there are rising hills. And he made a classic uh, Blario landing on the side of one of them, uh, therefore completing his uh, flight. That flight generated um, a lot of interest worldwide. France became recognized as the aeronautical leader at the time. The French became quite excited by it. And in fact, as you see on that poster on your left, they were planning some kind of uh, aviation meet. Uh, this was going to be held in, uh, as you see there, August the 22nd to the 29th. It was going to be a, the grand week of aviation. Uh, Blario solidified that and uh, generated a lot of worldwide interest. So now you have the interest, but uh, you need some uh, sponsors. And here we have some uh, vineyards that were uh, going to be part of the sponsor of this grand event. And if we go down and we look at the, uh, not only the sponsors, but if we look at the newspaper publisher, Gordon Bennett put up money as well. So between the newspaper publisher, Gordon Bennett, who was from the United States, as well as the vineyards there in France, there's gonna be prize money that would equal in today's dollars, about a million dollars in, in uh, different prizes. So we have now a sponsor, a venue, we have a trophy that's going to be offered to the main event and ever who won that race, it would be an air race, was going to be what they call the, the king of the aviators, at least for that time. So things were in place then following that uh, business model that we referred to earlier. And again, the money that would be available. Now what's amazing, it's 1909. Bear in mind, I know the Wright brothers flew in 1903. They had a good airplane in 1905, finally sold one to the uh, governments in uh, 1908, demonstrated in France as well. But the number of flying machines that entered the uh, event at Reims that was going to be held in August numbered about 38. 30 of them actually showed up, and you can see them listed here. Most of them were French. There was a Wright Flyer. Curtis, there was one, which we'll be talking about. Uh, 
So there was a different uh, variety of flying machines with the pilots, and there was kind of a collage of the pilots who represented some of those manufacturers or their airplanes themselves. You can see their names listed here. What made it an international event was we had Curtis uh, show up from the U.S., and we had an Englishman, uh, Cockburn, who was going to fly a Wright Flyer uh, with the approval of the Wrights. Uh, and uh, the rest were French. Uh, a lot of them noted pilots. Blario, of course, was, as I said, nationally recognized, if not worldwide by that time. So those were the, the stars of the event that would be flying the aircraft in a, a variety of events that were going to be taking place. Of the 38 machines that entered, 23 actually got in the air. And I find it interesting as well that you have 15 listed biplanes, but there seems to be a trend going on with the monoplane that would certainly uh, uh, point a direction uh, in the future, uh, especially after uh, World War II, uh, excuse me, World War I. So things are set. You have the pilots now, you have the sponsors, you have the planes. And if you look at that uh, background that you see, this was uh, sprung up on the planes outside of Reims. This is the grandstands that we'll show you that will hold a number of people over something like uh, 300,000 people came that week, they, they say. Uh, they had a uh, restaurant that could hold 600 people. So it was a well set up venue to hold the first uh, aviation meet uh, that was going to be uh, held. Um, it was also the social place to be seen. You can see the crowd on one of the days of that event uh, is uh, quite extensive. If you look in the background there and see the number of people that are in the stands. This uh, uh, poster again, it seems like the, the ladies in the crowd are uh, using the same type, type of hat. The men are there uh, trying to let the uh, ladies know how much they know about the event and aviation. Uh, looks like a, a grand time is being held by all. One of the things I see interesting in this photograph is the people that are standing there. Apparently canes were a uh, part of the fashion for the men in those days. But if you'll notice in the back here, these folks are standing up on stools so they can see over the folks in front. I'd be really upset if I paid a lot of good money to be sitting right in the first row in back of these folks and not being able to see anything. Uh, but that's, I guess, the way things were then. Anyway, uh, pressing on, uh, here's a picture of Gordon Bennett, who uh, sponsored a lot of events, uh, sporting events, including auto racing, as well as now it was going to be uh, events associated with uh, aircraft racing. But there are also seven other prizes, uh, which uh, made up part of this uh, aviation meet. All of them associated with some type of performance, as you see down there at the bottom of further, fire, uh, higher, and faster. You had uh, a prize for the uh, greatest nonstop distance. You also had a prize for the greatest altitude. At that time, they had, uh, the record was 165 feet, and I think they went up the, and broke that record. It was slightly higher than that. And then if you uh, continue on down, we have the race itself. This was the uh, very highly stylized uh, trophy that was going to be awarded to the winner of the Gordon Cup or the Gordon Trophy, which was a 20 kilometer race around the race course. It would be two laps around the race course. And again, the prize money that uh, was associated, that was pretty much uh, uh, going to be spread among the main events themselves. Now, one of the things that you see up there that I think is uh, important is the greatest number of passengers carry uh, payload. So you can have an aircraft going further, higher, and faster, and all that stuff, but uh, what, what can it carry in terms of cargo or passengers? So they had a passenger carrying contest. I would have loved to have seen that one. Um, here is the, a pre-flight discussion of the uh, passengers or the two passengers that, I don't know how they were selected, whether it was a drawing or they paid the highest price or whatever the case may be, but Farman uh, is talking to him in his Farman biplane. And here is a picture of them uh, seated in back of him uh, in a makeshift seat. 
and they would have to fly around the uh, course. Um, that would be something to see. I, I think the takeoff speed to the landing speed to the cruise speed to what you would stall at, there might be a window of maybe one mile per hour or so. So that would, uh, <laughs> I don't know if those folks were smiling by the end of the flight or not. Anyway, here's the Reams course layout. Uh, again, you can see uh, aspects of the grandstand here laid out. There's a scoreboard for everybody to see the events that were going on. It was a hexagon shape, six-sided shape, and six pylons around 10-kilometer course. For the Gordon Cup, you had to fly around that twice. And again, this would be the main event. It was purely based on speed and speed alone. Um, the uh, those that were entering this race would come through over the aircraft hangar areas or sheds, uh, enter the first pylon and then dive for speed and go around the course twice. On the back side of that course, it was open fields uh, and this would play a major role in the Gordon Cup when it was, uh, 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 they ran it the next to the last day of the meet. The uh, two main contenders, apparently, for this cup were, of course, were going to be uh, Blario, and there was one other from America, Len Curtis. All the other folks that were there competing, they were there with an entourage of mechanics and technicians and support. Uh, Glenn Curtis was sponsored by the Aero Club of America. He was sent over with himself, his aircraft, and a mechanic. Uh, and they worked in a shed and they worked uh, diligently. Uh, he went out and flew the machine just to test fly it, but his whole thing was to win the Gordon Cup. That was his aim. And ironically, he would be the first one to run the course. He went around twice and when he completed it, he finished with an overall speed of, uh, as you see here, 74.6 miles an hour. The other contenders weren't close. They were right flyers and they would average maybe 30 miles to 35 miles an hour in that neighborhood. But Louis Blario uh, was the favorite. Uh, he had the Blario monoplane. It was uh, relatively fast compared to the biplanes of its day. He was expected to be the winner. And of course, uh, with that, the reputation of uh, French aeronautics would uh, withstand uh, a, another high and carry it further uh, into the world view. Well, the first lap, uh, he really uh, clocked that one. Uh, he went around the course and he was four seconds faster than Curtis. Curtis, uh, of course, was realizing this and he didn't think he had a chance to win that cup. And, he and his mechanic had already started packing up to go home. That back course that we talked about earlier and the uh, fact that it had played a role, the heat of the day was heating that course up and it was turbulent. And Blario on his second time around had a heck of a time maneuvering through that uh, turbulence that was being caused. Remember, they're flying at pretty low altitude. So at the end of the second course, uh, they thought he had won, but it proved that his overall course speed was 46.8 miles an hour and giving the uh, trophy to Curtis. Curtis didn't know that he won until he heard the national anthem being played and then realized uh, somehow he pulled that victory off. So that was the kind of the exciting conclusion of the Reams race for the main trophy. Now, the caveat on that was the country that won would have to sponsor the event the following year. So that meant that event would have to come to the United States. However, because of the popularity of that venue and people coming and the revenue it generated, um, there were other air meets that sprung up quickly in this country. If we look at these posters, you see the Reams poster there once again, but uh, Los Angeles decided to hold the first air meet based on the model of uh, Reams uh, in January of 1910. 
the Belmont meet was the one that was going to be the one sponsored by the Aero Club of America to host the next uh, major cup. But there were several meets that sprang up before the October meet in 1910. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, as you probably know from, it looks like I'm sitting in the middle of a desert with this century plant in back of me. Uh, the next second meet in the United States was not too far from where I'm sitting. It was held in uh, Phoenix, Arizona in February of 1910. Uh, this postcard was just given to me by a friend who found it on eBay. So I just thought I'd throw it in there. But what it's showing is the, the popularity all of a sudden of aircraft and the interest towards it. Uh, from uh, Phoenix, it went to El Paso and it wound up a lot of uh, flying meets and flying demonstrations on the West Coast, including Seattle, all by the pilots that uh, participated in the Los Angeles meet. However, the big, uh, the big prize was still the Gordon Cup and things were making improvements. And one of the first barriers of um, these flyers was who was going to break the 100 mile an hour barrier. That was like breaking the sound barrier back in uh, those days. That was finally done by, uh, by a, a, a Depper Dusen in 1912, exceeded 100 miles an hour. But what's remarkable is this aircraft, the uh, Depper Dusen with the 160 horsepower Lerone engine, uh, they were finding out, you know, if you cover the structure and the skin, uh, don't leave it open like Blario did, it becomes rather streamlined and that improves your performance along with better engines and horsepower. As a matter of fact, in the Gordon Cup held again at rims, and you can see the, uh, the hangers in the background there at the bottom picture of the airplane, uh, the first four finishers, as the paper said, all finished in uh, the Dapper Dusens, and they flew so fast, it looks like they, they said, flying out of their skins. What was remarkable, the first four finishers all finished over 100 miles an hour. So progress was being made rapidly from that 47 uh, to 48 miles an hour of the first Gordon Cup to the 1913 event. And of course, now World War I was going to intervene and kind of, uh, uh, our attentions will be turning to the aircraft for other uses. So that kind of kind of summarizes how airplane racing got started and established uh, in the United States as well as in the um, uh, Europe, primarily in Europe. Uh, it was all pretty much shut down during World War I and uh, needed to get started back up again. So we're going to look how that transpired and um, look at the uh, air racing activity uh, for the 1920s. And that kind of brings us into the second phase of uh, the timeline we've been talking about. Now, I would mention <clears throat> another race that uh, became um, a race uh, of note was the Snyder Cup. Uh, which was for seaplanes, and it too was starting up again after uh, World War, after World War One. Uh, however, the United States did enter the first one and brought an aircraft over there that uh, did not um, even, uh, for the Gordon Cup anyway, did not even get off the ground. Something one of, some folks uh, wanted to make sure that wouldn't happen again, and those folks happened to be the folks at the Pulitzer uh, Publishing Company, the sons of uh, Joseph Pulitzer, who the race would be named after. And of course, there's a Pulitzer Prize for publishing that goes on to this day. But they wanted to establish a, as they say here, a perpetual prize for an annual trophy and the reasons for that, as you see listed on this slide, is to stimulate interest in aeronautics in this country again, and to give the public an opportunity to see some American aircraft uh, that have been built, and better yet, maybe even designed. There are plenty of American aircraft that were of uh, foreign design being built, or had been built in World War I in America, but encourage American design. Uh, they also wanted to advance uh, design in private and sport aircraft. So they had good motives that they wanted to get 
people interested in the overall aspects of aviation and to keep it in the forefront if they possibly could. Because it kind of went silent after World War I, and the only folks that were really keeping aviation alive would be uh, the barnstormers of the day. Uh, the post office was starting to come online, as well as some military activity. And uh, it could also be good for selling newspapers if you had some kind of interest that you're generating about a national uh, race of some kind. It didn't really become uh, the first time it was ever referred to as the national air races was in a, a 1922 and the name just kind of was used off and on until it finally stuck around 1926 on. So <clears throat> the first event was in 1920 and it ran until 1925. You can see the times, the dates, the location and the trophy itself, another handsome trophy to be won. It was kind of like, again, offering a uh, Super Bowl World Series type of prize to the top contender for the fastest times. The first race held in 1920 <clears throat> uh, was going to be used a variety of military aircraft. In fact, there was only one civilian aircraft and that was flown by Bert Acosta, it was an Italian airplane. And he was a civilian at the time and uh, it was a surplus airplane he apparently purchased or got somehow or was sponsored some way. But uh, they had 44 aircraft at the first event and they were going to put them in the air all at the same time. Uh, of those 44 aircraft, uh, 30, uh, 38 uh, were in the air, as I say, at one time and 24 actually finished the race. And they put them in flights of uh, those that were committee invitation class, they were the better military aircraft, a variety of DH-4s. Most of these airplanes were uh, DH-4s that the Army was flying after World War I. But it was going to be uh, a one-day event uh, held around Thanksgiving weekend, and they were going to hold that out on Long Island. And the takeoff point would be around Garden City at Mitchell Field. Now, that's not named after Billy Mitchell. That's Mitchell who had been a mayor of New York and uh, was killed in an aircraft uh, training accident during World War I. But from Mitchell Field, they'd fly seven miles southeast to Lutherberry Field, again, named after a uh, World War I ace. Um, and from there, they would go out and there would be a tethered balloon 15 miles to the northeast uh, make your turn uh, around the balloon uh, back to Mitchell Field. So uh, that would be a total of about 33 miles. So that would be the race course. Uh, here are the top three finishers are listed, and it was a respectable speed, 156 miles an hour. The aircraft, uh, Verville, was uh, the designer built by the Army. He worked for the Army. Verville would uh, turn to be a well-known designer with a long career in aviation. The second would be the uh, Thomas Moore MB-3A. Uh, that aircraft was much like a uh, regeneration of the uh, SPAD-13. And then, as I mentioned before, Bert Acosta, a civilian pilot who was, uh, had a good education, technical education out of California, uh, would be uh, a well-known test pilot and really eventually had quite an interesting career, a colorful career. It was might you would have even referred to as the bad boy of aviation. However, the winner, Lieutenant um, Mosley, as you see proudly standing here, he was a recipient of the first published uh, uh, Pulitzer uh, Trophy. And um, uh, again, now the oh, I want the oh, okay. Um, he won that race. Uh, and of course that put the army ahead of the Navy and this is where a rivalry would crop up between the army and the Navy um, that would uh, stimulate uh, further interest in the Pulitzer uh, uh, race, the annual race. <clears throat> One of the things they found out though, the course itself, it was um, uh, supposed to be uh, 33 miles and they based the times at that, of that race at, on a 33 mile course. 
uh, a pilot uh, noticed the, the standings and it seemed like uh, on that uh, DH4 in one of the uh, races, they had a speed of 140 miles an hour or some such thing. And he knew full well that DH4 would not go that fast, uh, even downhill at full throttle. So he uh, questioned uh, how the, the times were measured. Well, <clears throat> the balloon that was supposed to be out here on the morning of the race uh, did not show up. And so the uh, race committee said, well, we'll just use the windmill that's a little bit off here to our uh, west and to the north, and that's about the same distance. Well, they finally measured that, and the actual race miles were uh, just about 29 miles an hour. And that was the reason for the uh, speeds being what they, they were, where uh, the uh, DH was notably faster than it ever been before. So basically, there was no speed records established at the 1920 race, but that was going to be changed. At least they they got the races going, they generated the interest, and from that, <clears throat> they could go and start design uh, some better uh, aircraft based on the pursuit designs that were, were coming out. Here you see Alfred Verville. Alfred Verville, again, was a, a good engineer, a good designer. He found the formula that, of course, the way to build a racer is pretty straightforward. Make it as streamlined as possible and put the biggest engine in that you can. Here he used the, and, uh, the uh, 1920 uh, uh, airplane, a, a Packard, 558 horsepower. That's the engine for at, at race time. And from that, that generated kind of the basis of what other innovations and improvements and modifications would be to the race, uh, race aircraft in the future, which again will be covered by David Ledneiser as well as uh, Barry uh, Ladder when they talk on those subjects specifically. But the aircraft, as, as you can see here, is pretty sleek. For the 1921 race, <clears throat> Uh, Curtis entered the field. Bert Acosta is now the, one of the test pilots for Curtis. And they, they look closely at uh, a number of things to make improvements over a, a basic design. So they're going to innovate and emulate uh, from what had been successful, I guess, in 1920. Here you can see an airfoil that David Ledneiser provided looking at the uh, characteristics of that airfoil that would go on to this uh, Curtis CR-1. Another uh, improvement they made would be not only the power plant, but they put in radiators, which were uh, lamellin radiators that were referred to sometimes as pineapple shape or uh, lobster, uh, lobster pods, but essentially they were more streamlined, air could flow through them, rather than have that frontal area that was on the previous racer that you just saw. Uh, Bird actually uh, flew this course in winning time of 160, uh, or 100, excuse me, 176 miles per hour. And during that time, uh, on one of the laps, uh, the, uh, uh, a flying wire snapped and the wing vibrated and was shaking through the whole race and he completed the race. Nonetheless, he completed that race. Uh, the Army in 1922 <clears throat> really wanted to now uh, continue and uh, have an aircraft that they would be specifically for air racing and they funded $71,000 uh, for uh, a couple of airplanes to be built, which were called the CR-6, as you see pictured here. Uh, here again, they're pretty streamlined. The lanolin uh, radiators have been removed. Uh, what you will see is the Curtis engine now is going to be placed in that, that uh, D-12. And again, streamline it and you, now you're going to have a fast aircraft that would uh, be at least competitive with the other aircraft that might show up in the field. And again, the whole purpose is <clears throat> be able to beat Navy and the aircraft that they were flying, which were also Curtis's. So if we 
look at the field for 1922. It's a, a, a very much an improvement over the 1920 field. You see some new designs in here, including the Loeing, uh, the Verville Sperry R3, which was a retractable landing gear. Uh, you had the Curtis R6. So you had a much a more competitive field and more interest was being generated with these races. Uh, some of the improvements on these airplanes, as we look at them, uh, you can see the Verville in the uh, 1922 race, it came in third, I believe, uh, but in 1923, uh, it was first. So with the retractable gear, you have improved systems. On the Thomas Moore R5, if you look closely here, you can see you're starting to see incorporation of a, a better structure. That's corrugated metal on that particular aircraft. But <clears throat> if we look at the lineup for 1922, from first through second through third, Curtis was really making a name for itself in a variety of the aircraft that were not only in the field, but completed in the top three. Looking at the Curtis R6 at 205 miles an hour, uh, the pilot, uh, uh, McGon, uh, he would have some recognition and he would be uh, 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 establishing records with this aircraft, not only for the race, but after it as well. This pilot that you see from the, the Navy, uh, Midland, he will be in our next series when we talk about uh, transcontinental flying because he was part of the flight of a Fokker from San Francisco to Hawaii that was successful. Uh, so Curtis is making a name for itself and of course something they added and that was social events to the venue. Here you would have the aviators ball. Uh, obviously I, I don't know if the uh, the young lady uh, that's her fiance, husband or boyfriend but uh, certainly glad he's done what he was doing there, flying around the pilot. Somehow, uh, this uh, ad reminds me of today because apparently we use a lot of animals in our ads today. And back then we were doing the same thing. I don't know what uh, these two have in mind here or what they're looking at. I imagine the uh, smaller dog is telling the bigger dog who we'll call Rex, that uh, don't get any ideas about going out and uh, running after airplanes because it's not going to work. Uh, Billy Mitchell took the airplane that won the, the, uh, the race at almost uh, 223 miles an hour and established a short course uh, straight line of flight uh, speed record. I did that for a number of reasons. One, to have the speed record. Two, to promote Army. And three, uh, the importance of technology and uh, uh, keeping pace with this growing uh, field that uh, aeronautics and research and development can provide for the future. Yeah, so he didn't miss that opportunity at all. Uh, with that, about a year later, <clears throat> uh, the pilot who won the race in 1922 uh, did establish a world speed record uh, of uh, 236 miles an hour. So McGon uh, had a, uh, uh, he was being politically correct and letting the uh, record stand a bit before, before taking it immediately back. <clears throat> if we look at the 1924 Pulitzer uh, race, an interesting thing um, took place in one of the events. They had a race for uh, light aircraft. Uh, remember, part of their goal was to promote, uh, promote sport aviation. And here are the light aircraft that entered this uh, field in 1924 where the races were held in Dayton. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at all those engines, basically they're motorcycle engines, but you'll see uh, two names. Uh, uh, Driggs Johnson won the race and the Heath Feather was Ed Heath himself. So what that was based on was some mathematical formula where you take the aircraft uh, takeoff weight versus its empty weight, uh, the course flown. Um, it had to meet certain requirements within that formula. Basically you see those listed down here, uh, 60 miles an hour, 400 pounds, it had to fly the course of 250 miles and obtain an altitude of 5,000 feet. 
again marked by a balloon. And here's the formula to figure all that out. Based on that, the, the Driggs Johnson the JD1 was the, they called it a racer, the racer that won that event. Uh, it did get some attention. Uh, actually, the Army Air Corps uh, bought one and they were going to use it for evaluation. It went off to Dayton for just that and uh, was never heard of again. The other one that gained a little more recognition, Ed Heath. Ed Heath would be a well-known aircraft designer, light aircraft builder, was a big movement in the uh, home build effort. Uh, the the Penapol or the Penapol, as they say, a high wing uh, monoplane uh, was very popular in the 30s all the way through the 40s as a home built aircraft. So again, they were promoting aviation uh, through this type of competition. 1925 uh, saw the culmination of the Curtis uh, racers. This one is the R3C and it's flown by the army. The race was won by uh, this Lieutenant Betts and right after this Pulitzer race, uh, this airplane was converted to, to compete on floats for the Schneider Cup. Uh, but before we get there, if we look at the overall uh, progress that was made from 1920 to 1925, Again, the race uh, encouraged aircraft designs and innovations in the area of airframe, power plant, propellers, et cetera. At the same time, you can see that speeds increased on an annual basis. So progress was being made. Uh, yet um, uh, by 1925, budgets were becoming more and more scarce. And it was a question of whether the military was going to be able to compete in uh, future uh, annual air races or be, uh, 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 be able to afford to send their uh, machines, their equipment, uh, fuel, etc. But before that decision was made, a young uh, lieutenant by the name of Jimmy Doolittle, who will be prominent in national air race history, was going to fly in the Schneider Cup. He'd been training with uh, the Navy in Annapolis on float plane operations and doing research and development. There was a lot of, even though there was competition, there was a lot of uh, interchange between the services. And this race, the Schneider Cup, was being held in Baltimore. It would be a triangular course, as you see laid out here. Uh, the total distance around that course would be 31 miles. You're going to fly uh, around the course seven laps. So a total, I guess that would be 220 uh, uh, or 211 miles or so. And you are going to use that aircraft that was used in the Pulitzer 1925 event and flying that course around. And he, he pushed that aircraft to its limits. It wasn't that much slower than the land aircraft at 232 miles an hour. Yes, I'm dropping off the decimal points. But the point being made, the, he flew it well, he flew it fast, and he flew it hard. Fortunately, that aircraft survives, and you can see it and see its design at the Smithsonian Institute. I believe it's still at the Downtown Museum. Uh, you can see it's extremely streamlined from the floats to the flying wires and the radiators for the cooling of that power plant were embedded in the wings as you see here. And again, Larry, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Barry Ladder will be uh, talking about that when he talks about uh, the, the power plants that uh, were used in these various aircraft in a little more detail than I'm giving you here. So that kind of wrapped up the uh, the Pulitzer Trophy that was supposed to be perpetual for all time, but it did serve its purpose. Uh, 1926, we find that there was a venue uh, for an air meet, aviation meet, and that happened to be in my hometown of Philadelphia. Uh, that was going to be the 1926 National Air Race at what they call Model Farms Field. Model Farms was an area that was being set aside for housing development that hadn't happened yet. But here you can see a train track that's coming to the field area of 350 acres. Uh, you can see roads that were uh, available for uh, public transportation. So 
they were going to do that in conjunction with the 150th anniversary of the country's birth. And what you see here that is very interesting is a number of aircraft that uh, would become, in terms of not only aircraft, but companies uh, that would become rather famous early uh, aircraft, aircraft manufacturers. WACO, which Historic Flight has in its collection, not that model, but a later model. That one is the WACO 9. That was one of their first ones. The Travel Air 2000, the Eagle Rock, uh, the Super Swallow out of Wichita. They were all going to compete in, I guess, sportsman class. The uh, race at the time, the military did show up, but it was just with stock aircraft. Uh, there was nothing special about them in terms of uh, being designed for racing. And it was interesting to see that a Boeing airplane won a, uh, the national race. Uh, it wasn't a big trophy. It was called the Kansas City Rotary Club trophy. But nonetheless, it was a trophy, and that was probably the main one for that event. And uh, it, uh, it beat a Curtis uh, P2. Um, they tried to make a positive spin on that, and it was a good event. It just it didn't produce any speed records, obviously. And the reason for that, they were all stock aircraft. That was, uh, that was what was the, uh, the attraction. However, those stock aircraft, uh, what they said anyway, they, it was an improvement of, over other stock aircraft by pursuit aircraft of 14 miles an hour, observation aircraft 13 miles an hour, yeah, they were quite excited by the fact that the bombers uh, <laughs> were uh, 19 miles an hour faster over their previous uh, stock airplane. Now, how they figured that out, I don't know, but that's what some numbers that were given in the, the research that I did. Okay, so then we have the Philadelphia event, but the next three, Spokane, Los Angeles, and Cleveland, these were important because these were the transition years from uh, lessons that were learned moving into the 1930s that would establish a solid venue on an annual basis where air racing was a big spectator uh, public event. And we'll look quickly at uh, those three, starting off with um, Spokane, which was held in September of 19. Uh, September of uh, 19th, to uh, 19th to the 25th. And here we are at Phelps Field. And this is now the uh, home of a historic flight. Um, and you, here you can see where the field is uh, laid out and the national air races were going to be held there. Phelps Field followed the basic model that we've been talking about for a success of an air race. And they're going to capitalize on the fact that uh, Lindbergh flew uh, in May of 1927, obviously the Atlantic, have him involved some way, somehow. Um, the committee that uh, established that was basically the commander of the reserve, Army Air Reserve Unit there, uh, Francher, Major Francher who knew, of course, a lot of uh, Spokane businessmen, including the mayor who was off to his left. And he also uh, met Lindbergh when he returned uh, via boat with the uh, spirit of St. Louis back in New York and asked him if he would participate and uh, be the chair or uh, be part of the host of the national air races. Lindbergh agreed, but then he had to decline and cancel because he was going to go on his tour with the Spirit of St. Louis around the United States. However, he did show up and help promote uh, the uh, Spokane Air Races. Part of that, of course, would be some trophies, and they had the trophies for this race. Uh, they broke it up into the military pursuit race, uh, they had a Spokane Air Race trophy itself, uh, the Detroit News for transport airplanes to compete on some kind of an efficiency contest, uh, the Aero Magazine trophy itself, 
uh, these were all well thought out uh, and put in categories to have a venue that was pretty extensive for the week of the actual air race itself. And although Lindbergh could not be at the actual race, he did show up, uh, I believe, nine days before the race itself that was going to be in September, starting, starting in September the 23rd, and um, gave a presentation at the field promoting the event. Um, the field itself, <clears throat> uh, if we look at Phelps Field, here's a diagram of it. <clears throat> uh, there's the Spokane River. There's the train tracks that are running along that are still there. Uh, the field itself, about a, a little over a mile long. Uh, again, you saw this picture before, but <clears throat> the race would be uh, along, the spectators would be along where the hangars are now, and the actual closed course where the pursuit aircraft would fly, uh, be flying uh, would be off to the uh, to the north, as you see the triangle here. And again, they would have Army, Navy pursued aircraft participating. However, they also instituted something that would be the forerunner of things to come. They came up with uh, the National D Air Derby Race and the Pacific Coast Air Derby Race, in addition to close course events in the other regular venues as aerobatic flying, parachute jumping, etc. If we look at this, <clears throat> this was go going to attract a lot of attention. And it would be from New York uh, to Spokane in two classes of aircraft, and then from uh, California uh, to Spokane, again, in two classes of aircraft. And it was really the precursor to what would be called the, uh, the Appendix Trophy Race, that started in 1931 and run all the way to 1962. But here we can see the course for both the, uh, the uh, 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 race from New York to Spokane, as well as from San Francisco into Spokane. Again, the two classes would be an A and a B class. <clears throat> the A class would be for any aircraft uh, with a horsepower over 100 horsepower. And then the uh, B class would be any aircraft with 100 horsepower uh, or below. And they have a slightly different route. Um, it was timed so that they would uh, hopefully arrive on the same day and they, they were shooting for, I think, the uh, 24th of September. Uh, there would be a one day race from San Francisco with 925 miles to Spokane. So while you're waiting for the cross-country flyers to come in, you'd have activity for uh, people to participate in in terms of uh, the air shows, uh, the minor races. They had over uh, something like, uh, oh, I think I, the number I remember is around 50,000 uh, people on a daily, uh, per day during that whole week. <clears throat> now, moving to 1928, uh, the person who would manage the air races in LA, his name was Cliff Henderson, and he was a pilot. He was interested in flying, but he also was a, a master promoter. Uh, he took the 1928 uh, Los Angeles meet, had the uh, menu of air races, plus a uh, kind of a uh, expo of aircraft on display and with that he also brought in uh, some business people who were looking at the 1929 event that was going to be held in Cleveland and they liked uh, what they were seeing in LA they got some ideas from that and they also hired uh, Henderson and his brother to manage that event for them and be the uh, air race management. And he would do that through the uh, 29 event all the way up until just about World War II. Um, Cleveland in 1929 was making a play to be, if for lack of a better word, the air capital of the world. They wanted the world to know about 
what they had done. They had built an air terminal, second to none, all on their own money, meaning uh, the city money. It wasn't any federal funds that were given to, uh, to support that effort initially. And they wanted to bring a main event attention to it, and that would be the air races would do that. <clears throat> now, one of the things that uh, you see here is the layout of their field. Uh, it was an active airfield. They had the commercial operations here on the east side. Uh, you could have air races going on while you continue your normal operations. That was kind of, kind of the plan because on the other side of the field would be where the air races would be held. They'd have a different pattern and the, the grandstands would be placed uh, uh, far enough away so the planes could operate in the and the crowd would have some safety. <clears throat> but one of the innovations that came about and uh, Henderson promoted, they were going to have a women's air derby. So taking a, a, a page from uh, Spokane and their air derby, they were going to have, as I said before, I just said, as a matter of fact, a women's air derby. And that would be from uh, Santa Monica, uh, kind of through the Southwest, heading north up to the Wichita area and then into Cleveland itself. Uh, the women that would compete, uh, the, actually 20 of them uh, entered that race. And that's rather remarkable because at the time, there are about only 120 licensed women pilots in the United States. So you can say roughly 20% competed in that race. Uh, the press, of course, had to give it the name uh, Powder Puff. Uh, I don't know if they were trying to be cute or derogatory or whatever, but everybody sort of liked that, including the ladies themselves, and we've had the powder puff derby for uh, years since. Nonetheless, there are some wonderful women pilots in there that uh, flew that race, uh, notable ones. Here are two. I guess you can uh, point them out quite easily to me. You have Amelia Earhart, of course, standing right here, Poncho Barnes, uh, uh, Louis uh, Thaden is on the end there. Uh, they uh, gave quite an effort and a good showing on that uh, first women's transcontinental race. Uh, if you look at Poncho Barnes, I think this is a great picture. Back in the day, uh, the pilot's license, you were supposed to have a picture. This was her picture that she posed for, for her pilot's license. Uh, the, the reality was uh, whether she smoked or not, I really don't know. Um, a lot of women at that time obviously uh, did not, <clears throat> but she was the real deal. She was a great pilot. She flew the, uh, uh, what they referred to as the Beechcraft uh, Travel Air Mystery Ship. She flew it, flew it well. Of course, in later years, she was well known for uh, running the uh, uh, Happy Bottoms Ranch out by Edwards Air Force Base, which the government wanted to take away from her at the end, and she took them to court, eventually won. Unfortunately, she, her health wasn't good by the time that was all settled, but she was just one of the many uh, great pilots, women pilots at the time. One you don't hear too much about is uh, Blanche uh, Wilcox. That was her, obviously, her maiden name. She was an actor of note, turned to aviation, really uh, fell in love with aviation, became a good pilot herself. But her uh, uh, behind the scene efforts were the improvement of airports, airways, and that sort of thing. Uh, she was in that race as well, flying a travel air named Miss Cleveland. And here you can see the results of the uh, classes that they had the uh, women flying. Uh, the D class was from anywhere from, as you see there, 210 cubic inches up to 800 cubic inches and then the lower C class. Nonetheless, um, there was some controversy initially. Uh, the women took care of that. There was some kind of restriction. They didn't want the women to fly the higher horsepower aircraft because they were just too much to handle. That, uh, well, <clears throat> that just uh, wasn't the case at all. And you can see the uh, trophy, the woman's uh, trophy that uh, they were competing for. So the women now make an entrance and they were uh, here to stay and they would enter into the Benedict's race a little later on when it would come about. In that 1929 uh, race, they had the inaugural Tom Thompson Cup race. That was uh, the, the main event. 
uh, Doug Davis won that in a travel air R. And what's interesting about his winning, he was a civilian and he uh, beat all the military aircraft that had entered as well. Here you can see some other upcoming names such as Roscoe Turner, which we'll be talking about here in a few minutes. <clears throat> Uh, Doug Davis uh, is with the trophy. Um, he uh, unfortunately lost his life in the 1933 air race uh, to recircling a pylon. Uh, you know, he stalled out at low altitude. Uh, <clears throat> at that race, uh, Lindbergh did make an appearance, and there were some other celebrity pilots, uh, Jimmy uh, Doolittle, who won the Snyder back in 1925. Lindbergh was there, and the Navy had a uh, demonstration aerobatic team. I don't want to say a precursor to the Blue Angel. It wasn't quite that, but nonetheless, it was their uh, uh, demonstration team, and they were called the Seahawks. Their lead pilot became ill, and they asked Lindbergh if he would like to step in. Now, they didn't do anything really hairy, but uh, they put him in the lead and followed his wingtip, and flew some demonstration flights and imagine they did a few aerobatic maneuvers. Actually, these aircraft, if you look very closely, this is the actual three Seahawks. And one of their routines was they would tie their wingtips together uh, to uh, fly their routine. Jimmy Doolittle um, was noted at the time for doing uh, outside, uh, outside loops. And he'd been warned not to do that. He had an accident down in uh, South America, uh, performing one. But he had a new aircraft here, and it was an experimental Curtis uh, P-1 Seahawk. And he was out practicing that maneuver, that is, an outside loop. And somewhere uh, in the pitch under, uh, had some structural failure. And the result of that was the aircraft landed uh, pretty hard, didn't take the beating so well. Fortunately, Jimmy Doolittle had uh, bailed out. Uh, now, he was under orders not to do that maneuver, but as he said, I was really not doing that maneuver. I was just, uh, uh, to do that maneuver, to do an outside loop, you have to complete the loop. He would just do half of it and roll out. Well, whether he was trying that or the actual loop itself, I don't know, but that was the result of it. Nonetheless, um, he was still in the military at that time, and he would uh, be flying in some future uh, national air races. <clears throat> anyway, again, if we look at that uh, transition years before the national ra uh, air races have sponsors and uh, venues and aircraft, uh, you see some kind of mixed results with the Philadelphia one with only 180 miles an hour. Uh, 201 miles an hour for the Spokane with the pursued aircraft being the fastest. Again, there were stock airplanes here. And finally, you have a civilian aircraft that is out flying them all. And that uh, kind of motivated the military to get back in the game. So the 1930 uh, air races, which were now going to be held in Chicago, the reason they're going to be held in Chicago is that the airport was having some more modifications to it and uh, planned to uh, have the airplanes, or excuse me, the airport ready for the 1931 uh, race. So if we move down into this area now, we're transitioning into a period where aircraft improvements are going to be high, happening rapidly because of technology innovations and in aircraft design. The research and development was being done back here is now being implemented into aircraft designs up here. Now, that's not necessarily because of the air races per se. The air races uh, would incorporate a lot of that technology into the aircraft that they would be using. So we'll move into the 19, uh, the 30s. And uh, again, you have to have good management. The Henderson brothers were very good, for, uh, as I said before. They uh, now would be making improvements along the way in the uh, venues that they would be holding. Those venues, for the most part, were going to be held in Cleveland. Uh, two were going to be held in uh, Los Angeles, 1933 and 1934. But as you can see here, we have some consistency. You're going to have consistency in 
management and operations expectations, which makes for an overall better program with probably improvements each year. Uh, again, more aircraft, civilian aircraft are starting to make the scene with their designs. The Travel Air uh, Mystery Ship that uh, was introduced in uh, 29 is now going to be used by a number of people. Uh, Benny Howard would have two airplanes, uh, Benny and Pete as they would uh, be named, and Speed Hallman who won the Spokane Transcontinental Race back in uh, 1927. Would, uh, is going to fly the uh, Lair uh, solution uh, in the, uh, the Thompson race itself. <clears throat> uh, so we have these two new uh, airplanes um, coming along uh, that again are uh, outperforming some of the military airplanes. Speed Hallman and uh, the Lair solution, this is a, an interesting story. He was sort of a last minute pilot, uh, Goodyear, based in Chicago, wanted to have an aircraft in that race. Um, they hired Matty Lair to design the airplane. It was on short notice. The pilot, the chief pilot was for Goodyear, whose name escapes me right now, was to fly that airplane. But he felt that uh, it wasn't going to be ready in time and would decline. Speed Hallman uh, accepted. Speed Hallman actually flew and tested this airplane the day of the race across town at another airfield and flew it to the main event uh, where it was being held in Chicago. Uh, so he had about uh, maybe 30 minutes or so of flight test time. He flies it over to the main event and participates in this. And here you can see him. Uh, rounding a uh, pylon. This is an interesting shot, by the way. You can see the crowd. You can see Frank Hawks in the Texaco um, uh, Travel Air has retired. He's out of the race. You see an airplane uh, with uh, uh, on the seventh lap. Hallman's in it, about ready to go around the pylon. And another one pulling up. That's Captain Page of the United States Navy. Uh, as we look at the results of that race, uh, you can see Hallman won the race and Captain Page did not finish. Actually, what was happening during that pull-up, he was not apparently feeling well, was pulling up out of the race and stalled and went uh, in, into the ground. It was determined that he, because these racers were uh, built for speed and not necessarily for anything else, uh, carbon monoxide was coming into his uh, cabin. And as a result of that, that's, they determined he uh, passed out and uh, that was uh, resulting in his accident, unfortunately. Um, now we're coming back to, to Cleveland again and Cleveland is in love with their air races and so is the nation. Uh, they had all kinds of events during uh, prior to, during, and after the races. And this is just an example of one of those. Here you can see, it looks like a demonstration. It's not, it's part of a parade. And what they are doing is it's a welcome back to the air races to Cleveland. And they <laughs> uh, talk about changing times. This is a parade of different uh, 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 types of nationality that have been in the States and they're either they or their parents have immigrated from a foreign country. So you had the Irish section, you had the German section, you had the English section, you had uh, the Spanish section, et cetera, as part of the parade. Uh, <clears throat> the airfield itself had some improvements done. They moved the pylon, they put up additional buildings. These buildings would accommodate the uh, military as well as the air racers of a better place to, to uh, have hangars for your aircraft, do maintenance on them between events, et cetera. The grandstands were enlarged on the other side of the field. Not only were they enlarged, they moved the pylon so um, it would have be better viewing, but the grandstands themselves would remain. These were going to be permanent grandstands. So, Cleveland definitely wanted to have the venue there at their location. Uh, along with that, billboards everywhere advertising the event. Um, the Hendersons would put up an expo hall 
were the uh, new air, well, not the newest, but aircraft of all types on display. Here you can see the Boeing uh, Model 40. And out by City Hall, they would actually post a Boeing Model 80 passenger aircraft, which was at that time part of United uh, uh, Aircraft and Transportation Corporation, all under kind of United Airlines. Obviously, you see some scaffolding here where people could come in the gate and actually get inside an airliner. So you're trying to expose people to what air travel is, what it looks like, uh, even though it might be expensive, you at least have the opportunity to see what the inside of an airplane does look like. And not to mention the nightly uh, social events. Uh, I, I found this uh, rather interesting, the Wings of Love Review. And uh, the uh, ladies that are doing their precision dancing, I mean, that's as precision as any of the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds uh, ever hope to be in terms of getting your wings close together. <clears throat> Uh, the events were many and, uh, and often, and you could run, uh, run your clock by them. 46 aerial events and all. And this was kind of going to be the model for the air races from about this time to the 1940s or when they were ceased to go into operation due to the war, World War II. Another event came about, and that was the Bendix uh, Transcontinental uh, Trophy Race. Uh, here you can see Vince Bendix with the, the trophy itself. And I guess the, all these trophies were built by, or not built, but designed and crafted by noted artists. <clears throat> but uh, the distances would be from one coast to wherever the venue was for that year. In this case, it's from California to, uh, the, uh, to Cleveland. It could be nonstop or refuel. What you're trying to do is encourage aircraft design, performance, uh, range, uh, altitude capability, et cetera. And of course, the prize money that goes with that. That drew in a number of people, including Jimmy Doolittle, our Aker. You can see it listed here. Jimmy Doolittle uh, flew the Lair Solution and he won the first uh, Bendix uh, Trophy race. So now he's won two major races. He's won the uh, Schneider Cup our trophy, and he's also now won the uh, Bendix, the first Bendix in a layer solution. Uh, you can see others uh, listed there. It looks like Lockheed is making a real play uh, for some aircraft that enter. They come in uh, from second all the way through to seventh. So there's a lot of notable aircraft with uh, uh, noted pilots that uh, in time would be definitely legendary if they weren't already. <clears throat> Here you can see do a little on arrival on the layer solution, uh, giving uh, his comments and uh, to the press. A lot of media attention uh, would go to this. It'd be in a lot of different magazines, publications, newspapers, et cetera. And these folks were really keeping uh, uh, the aviation on the forefront uh, during a tough time period, uh, because we've got to remember from 29 through the, almost the beginning of World War II, too, we have a depression era going on. One of the things the Hendersons did was just like football and baseball and basketball teams are doing now, um, they would sell off season tickets. And here they're selling season tickets to get people into the stands and they would have companies buy big blocks and be able to give them out to the public or their customers to promote uh, not only themselves, but also the, the Cleveland Air Races that uh, would be held in the years coming. So this would be after the race kind of activity that the Hendersons would incorporate. And they're always trying to bring youth in here. You can see a lot of young uh, fellows with uh, uh, sunglasses on, just like their, their favorite pilots wear. Of course, all pilots wear sunglasses. And <clears throat> get to see some of the fastest and the best design aircraft uh, up close and uh, whizzing right by you. Uh, new designs such as the GBs where the various variety of GBs were starting to make the scene. Uh, women uh, were coming more and more to these races. If you look at the ladies here, they all seem to be quite interested. They too have some sunglasses on. I say all, uh, not not so much this lady. She's maybe seen enough of it, but nonetheless, uh, a lot of, uh, of activity to be seen. 
the Granville brothers were making a name for themselves with their GBs and the GBZ. Here you see the 1931 closed course race, the Thompson race. Uh, Bayless won that one. Unfortunately, he would lose his life trying to establish a, speed, a, a straight line speed record. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, after this race and would lose his life in a GBC. Um, but education was a big part of this too. A lot, all these air races, as a matter of fact, if you look at the venues, if you ever got a hold of an old venue and see all the different types of activities they had, one was model flying contest. Uh, this one is being held at the branch library in Cleveland and these meetings would go on all year and it just wasn't for the guys. They would encourage uh, the ladies to participate as well. <clears throat> and the events would be coming bigger and bigger. You would get uh, all kinds of uh, pilots coming from all over the place. Uh, the women who were now flying in some of the uh, events themselves, it would be part of the group, the in crowd, if you will, standing around all the other um, camaraderie that's going on. One pilot that became very popular here in the States uh, with these races was uh, uh, German, Germany's uh, Major uh, Ernest Udat, who was uh, obviously, an, he was an ace during World War I. He would fly a, a young monster uh, and do aerobatic flying, picking up hankies with his wingtips, etc. cetera. At uh, one of the races, he made arrangements for a Wanamaker, I think who was um, uh, the mayor of Akron, Ohio, to be his guest at the Cleveland Air Races. The connection was that uh, uh, Udot, uh, Udat, he shot down Wanamaker, and when he did, Wanamaker landed in Germany. Uh, uh, Udat landed his airplane next to him, uh, made sure he was okay. He uh, was bleeding from the head, but he hit his head apparently in the accident and gave him a kind of a, a bandage or a handkerchief to hold. Uh, the German medics came to help Wanamaker. In the meantime, Udat went and uh, cut off the uh, tail of Wanamaker's uh, airplane. And that's it, what you're seeing, you're looking at it. And I believe that was, I don't know exactly which uh, victory that was for UDOT, but uh, UDOT, uh, he uh, uh, kept that and he presented it to Wanamaker at the Cleveland Air Races. So he got part of his airplane back. <clears throat> Meantime, we move on, you see some new pilots coming into the scene, not entirely new. Benny Howard had been there before, but he was designing some rather small, sleek, uh, inline engines, fast performing aircraft. Um, Hall had an airplane and he flew uh, uh, two types, uh, a mid wing and a high wing. Uh, the speeds that they would be turning out would be, um, they're hidden here behind me, but uh, Heslip won the uh, race in 1932. And of course, gets congratulations from many, including Amelia Earhart. So all the known pilots were involved, hanging around in there, participating in one way or the other. Amelia Earhart would be flying in the uh, Bendix races um, herself. <clears throat> so this is a 1932 uh, Thompson Trophy event, and it's a great shot. I don't know who took it, but Bob Hall, who would become a, a uh, well-known test pilot, uh, for Grumman. You can see Roscoe Turner in the Wendell Williams airplane, which strikingly looks similar to a uh, travel air, but it's, but it's different. Jimmy uh, Doolittle flying a GB uh, in the uh, Thompson Trophy event. And in that event, Jimmy Doolittle, he actually uh, won the event. So now he's won all three of the major trophies. He's won the Thompson Trophy. He's won the uh, uh, Schneider Cup as well as the uh, Bendix Trophy. At the conclusion of this race, um, he had an interview with the press and he said, I have yet to hear anyone engaged in this work dying of old age. So he exited from this type of competition. Uh, he was working for uh, Shell at the time. He actually had uh, resigned his uh, full-time commission, although he was a reserve 
officer in in the uh, in the reserve army air corps reserves he was working as a civilian obviously he would go back in in world war ii and establish yet another name for himself i'd recommend a book um that i could never be so lucky again it's uh, his life story it's absolutely fabulous and it covers a number of these events that we've been uh, talking about and here you can see him going by the uh, the, the bendix uh, 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 pylon uh, the speed for that race was over 252 miles per hour as the races started to progress and here's the Los Angeles one a variety of new airplanes were making the scene and this particular race uh, it would be um, the uh, 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 Bendix race uh, and here you see a Vance flying wing, which was part of the uh, aircraft that at least entered, but uh, maybe did not uh, not, not finish. Servesky, uh, another uh, designer that would lead eventually to the P-47, but even before that, here are some of the, the testing ground for the types of con uh, concepts he was incorporating into his aircraft design. This is an amazing airplane that was uh, designed by Benny Howard that won the 1935 Bendix uh, and uh, Thompson winner, uh, Mr. Mulligan. Um, uh, that was uh, a rare feat. As things progress, the 1936 trophy contenders that did not finish the Bendix race, uh, the, the uh, three that were still in the race. These are three that did not finish, including Mr. Uh, uh, Mulligan. This is again flown in 1936. But of the five remaining, you have uh, the ladies again, Lewis Thaden in a uh, uh, Beechcraft uh, 17. Um, Emilia Earhart came in fifth, Laura Ingalls, she would come in second. That was quite a showing for the ladies in the group that finished, uh, the five that finished. Um, another lady that was making the scene that would become well known in not only uh, air race circles, but other places in aviation as well, uh, Jacqueline Cochran. She, uh, she entered uh, the Bendix in 1937 and won it in 1938 with a uh, Sorvesky P-35. Uh, that aircraft would eventually uh, um, be the P-47. I mean, it would have it, the P-47 would have its roots from this airplane. So if we look at the summary of the Thompson trophies uh, from 33 to uh, closing out in 1939, you can see that it's an increase in speeds from 1933 to uh, Roscoe Turner with his uh, Laird Turner uh, special. Uh, this airplane's on display at the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, that one is at uh, uh, Dulles. Uh, and the, uh, the prize money increased as well. <clears throat> uh, this airplane, as I said, you'll be able to see this. This is, a, this is what you call getting all the innovations and putting it all into one aircraft. It's a, it ha could have its influences from, uh, of course, the uh, Beechcraft uh, mystery ship, as well as the Windle uh, racer, as well as the Turner and Turner uh, 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 Laird and Turner Racer. Uh, you can see it won the trophy in uh, 38 and 39. It both uh, near uh, one was uh, very close to the same speeds in each year. <clears throat> uh, Roscoe Turner, he, he defied the odds uh, with this aircraft because uh, as uh, Jimmy Doolittle said, uh, he has yet to meet anyone who uh, lived to be an old age in this game. Roscoe Turner actually was able to do that. And this trophy race in 1939, the Thompson Trophy Race, when it was over, he said, let him in. And he was talking to the people who are trying to keep the reporters away from him. Let them all in because he says, this boys was my last race. And uh, he did retire from racing and did live to a pretty good age. Uh, and he wrote a book, Air Racing as Hell. And there was some obviously truth to that. Everybody who was involved in it was doing it because obviously they had a passion for it. They liked it. Uh, they didn't make much money at it. The engine manufacturers would lend engines to 
the air racers and of course they want them back and the air racers eventually give them back but they were so run out that uh, they just said you can keep them for the most part but <clears throat> when you look at all the air races that were taking place other than the main ones we just talked about there are other uh, events going on annually across the country and this sheet here just shows you some of those it's just too many to cover in a session like we're trying to do the purpose of this overview is to kind of stimulate an interest and further study on your own some questions we can ask was was air racing really benefit uh, to aviation many folks have argued that it wasn't um, i think i would take the opposite position i think it was i think it definitely was uh, in, in what way well <clears throat> it maybe it didn't advance aircraft designs but it sure proved concept for uh, aircraft designs and it took aircraft designs and implemented them into the aircraft that they had and again you'll be uh, referred to that in the upcoming presentations uh, uh well you might say it didn't promote air travel that wasn't its purpose its its purpose was to uh, be a function that the public would be interested in Therefore, there's entertainment there. I don't believe for a second people came out to see accidents. Uh, I hope that wasn't the case. Uh, of course, sacrifices were made, but uh, it was a proving ground for innovations, for fuels, oils, O-rings, um, uh, streamlining, you, you can name it. And the biggest thing it did, it promoted aviation when uh there was a period where uh aviation wasn't always at the forefront after the Lindbergh event it sparked aviation and, and carried some innovations and designs and education into the industry air racing was one of the key elements that kept it going so with that uh they all were trying to go as i say faster further and higher and they certainly did that in many respects. And the bottom line of all this <clears throat> would be, I think we, uh, we thank them and we owe them a lot. And in the same time, uh, uh, and we thank you for uh, you know, listening to the presentation and being interested in this. And usually at the end of a presentation, I usually have some references, but the best reference I can take you to because it'll take you to other references as well, would be the Society of Air Racing uh, Historians. They have a wonderful website. You could just put that into your browser, search it, it'll pop right up. It's a nominal fee to belong and it gives you access to all kinds of interesting air racing uh, facts and data from the beginning to the present day. So with that, that's our overview to kick off this session on our history of air racing, as I say. Uh, following this one in a week or so, look on our website, you'll be able to find uh, out the uh, other ones to follow. Plus, for those of you who are on our mailing list, it'll be sent out to you. So, uh, exiting once again from the uh, coop here in Arizona, where I'm currently staying, until I can get out of here. It's getting warm down here, folks. We're going to have 100 degrees this week. Um, and uh, right now the coop, uh, I'm working on the air conditioning, hope I get it working. But in the meantime, have a, uh, a, a, a good day, and stay safe, and we'll talk to you soon. I'm looking forward to meeting you at Historic Flight. Take care.